as ready to get into God's word this morning. Amen. And would you meet me in Colossians chapter 1? You know, we began a study in the book of Colossians, and we're making our way through. And this morning, we'll start at verse 24 of chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and we've titled this series of the book of Colossians called Jesus Over Everything. Jesus Over Everything, and we've been seeing how Paul's argument is that Jesus has preeminence and supremacy over everything. He is sovereign, he is over everything, and that will be um, Paul's argument as he tries to help this church that he's never met to see that whatever This teaching that these uh, false teachers are bringing to uh, the church there at Colossae, that Christ is sufficient and that he has everything that they need. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 24. If you're there, say, I got it. If you don't have a Bible, we put it on the screen for you so that you can follow along with us. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. It's God's word. The title of the message is Ministry 101. Ministry 101. My brother, one of his first cars that he got was a Jag. And every now and again, he would let us drive it. And I hated driving that car because you barely touch on the gas pedal and you would go really, really fast. And I, every time I drove it, I was always afraid I was going to hit children because as I'm driving, I'm thinking, I don't have much control if I put the kind of pressure I put on it in my car. And so driving that car was, was, was difficult for that reason, but also because whenever he gave it to me, I always felt like this is an expensive car, it's a powerful car, it's not my car, and I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to hit something. I don't want somebody to hit me. And so I was always very nervous to drive this car because I understood something very, very fundamental about it, that the car wasn't mine. If it was mine, I probably wouldn't have cared that much. Now, he had insurance and all that, but you ever drive in somebody else's car and you're just like, man, I don't want to mess this thing up. And that's how I felt. It was something he had given to me to manage. It wasn't mine. And this is Paul's idea when he's thinking about ministry. Ministry is really, Paul says, a stewardship. The word that he uses there for commission is the word oikonomia, which is a word that would be used for a a slave or a servant who would manage his his master's house. And Paul believes that the, the ministry that God has given to him is a stewardship. It's something that he's supposed to manage. And Paul's going to tell us what that thing is. But when we think about stewardship, we we typically think about money. And that's right. But really, stewardship is all that God has given you, are using all that God has given you so that you can use it for his glory. Manage it and then one day give it back to him. Hopefully in the same condition or in better condition than when you first got it. 
So Paul's, Paul here is going to talk about his ministry, and he's going to give us what real ministry is. If we're going to talk about what is ministry, Paul this morning is going to teach us what ministry is. We're kind of going to be in his classroom, and it's going to be, I think, a, a really interesting uh, study. Now, one thing before we get into what Paul has to say about ministry, I want to say that in the kingdom of God, there is, there are no bench players. Amen. No one in the kingdom of God rides the pine. Now, maybe when you were in school, you rode on the bench because you weren't very good. But in the kingdom of God, there are no bench players. In fact, if you say that you are part of the body of Christ, you've been drafted onto God's eternal team, and you are sitting on the bench, you are in a lot of trouble. Because to be a so-called Christian and to be sitting on the bench, you are really in a precarious position. Because to be a Christian with no ministry is to be no Christian at all. God saved you to put you on the field. God saved you to put you on the court. He didn't save you so that you can sit on the sidelines and watch the game. So everybody in the body of Christ who is saved has a ministry. And this morning, Paul's going to say, what does that ministry look like? And what he's going to show us is the nature of ministry and also the goal of ministry. What is the nature of ministry and what is the goal of ministry? So when we look to this morning... Let's first look at the what is the nature of ministry. And we're going to look at four uh, different areas. What we must endure, what we must be, what we must proclaim, and what we must do. What we must endure, what we must be, what we must proclaim, and what we must do. So let's take these one at a time. Number one, what we must endure. What we must endure, Paul says, suffering. Look again at verse 24. It says, now... I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. If you're going to try and get somebody into ministry, you probably wouldn't start with this. <laughs> Suffering. But this is what Paul starts off saying, that ministry, if you're going to be in ministry, you are going to suffer. And if you read Paul at all, any of his letters, you know that Paul was very familiar with suffering. In fact, when Jesus first called him, he said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. When you read Paul, he is constantly talking about his sufferings. And in one particular passage, when he's talking to the church at Corinth, he gets very specific about the things that he has suffered. And it's amazing to see how much Paul went through. Let me just read to you. This is 2 Corinthians 11. This is Paul talking about his suffering. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times, watch this, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. There's a lot of danger. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I faced daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? See, Paul, he was no stranger to suffering. And if you get into ministry, you have to know that you're going to suffer. But I don't know if you notice what Paul said there. He said something that sounds really strange. He says, I rejoice in what was suffered for you. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ and his afflictions. Now, if I didn't know any better, Paul, that sounds a little, I don't know, heretical. Because it sounds like what Paul is saying is that, what I'm doing is I'm filling up in my flesh what is lacking in the sacrifice of Christ for the sins of his people. 
that there's some lack there. He says, I'm filling up what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. Now, if Paul was saying that, that would be heretical. Because the Bible is very clear, Jesus on the cross did not say, almost. Amen. Close. <laughs> Jesus on the cross said, tetelestai, it is done. The debt has been paid in full. On the cross, Jesus absorbed all the wrath of God, the cup of wrath he drank down to the last drop. So there is no needed extra suffering added on to the death of Christ for his people. And you know that because you read Paul in other places who says, he says that. So then what then is Paul talking about when he says, I'm filling up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ? What does he mean? Well, first we have to go back and, and, and talk about the connection between Christ and the church. There's a close connection between Christ and the church. If you remember back in Acts 9 when Jesus first encountered Paul, first encountered Jesus, Jesus knocks him off his horse. And remember, Paul had been persecuting the church. And do you remember when he knocked him off, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting who? Me. Me. You know what Paul said? He said, who are you? He said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Now, remember, Jesus is in heaven. He's not on earth physically. So how is it that he can say, you are persecuting me? Well, this is what we call the unity we have with Christ. We are in Christ. It's almost as if we're sharing a central nervous system with Christ. That when we hurt, he hurts. When he, we are thrown in prison, it's like he is thrown in prison. And we know this because Paul, he talks about Christ being the head. And we know that the head is connected to the body. And what the body is feeling, the head is also feeling. We all know this. When I came in here this morning, nobody said, there goes Shala and his head. <laughs> or there goes Shala's head and his body. Right? We all recognize they go together. And so when, when Jesus says you're persecuting me he's saying that when you throw a christian in jail it's like throwing me in jail this makes sense of matthew 25 where he says um whatever you did to the least of one of these brothers of mine you did to me which make remember they said uh he said um you gave me cold water you visited me in prison they're like what when did that happen we never seen you when were you visit you in prison he said whenever you did that to one of the least of these brothers of mine you did to me and so there's this close connection between Christ and his church. We're, uni we're in union with Christ. So we have to start there. So this close connection that we have with Christ. Now, what does he mean, though, when he says he's filling up what's lacking in what's in regard to Christ's afflictions? There, Paul uses this phrase in another part of the Bible, Philippians chapter 2. You don't have to turn there, but there in Philippians chapter 2, the church sent a gift to Paul, and they couldn't be there to give it to him personally, so they sent a man named Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus took this gift to him, and on the way there to take the gift, he almost died. And Paul said, I'm glad God spared him because it spared me sorrow upon sorrow. But what Paul says about this gift, he says this in... Um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 30, he says, for he nearly died, talking about Epaphroditus, for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete, here's what he says, what was lacking in your service to me. So it's that same phrase, what is lacking in your service to me. Now, there was nothing lacking in the gift itself. So what was it that was lacking? Well, what could the Philippian church not give to Paul that Epaphroditus could? And they, Epaphroditus was able to personally give that gift to Paul. And so what Paul is saying when he says that he is filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, he's saying that the church, Christ's body, as they take the gospel, God's gift of love to the world, that there is still much suffering to be endured by the church. And it's Christ suffering. Why? Because we are united with Christ. And so what's not lack, the word affliction is never used when talking about the substitutionary atonement of Christ. It's always talking, we use that word affliction, it's always dealing with um, his sufferings in terms of people persecuting. So when he says that he's filling up, he's saying, I on earth, as I take the gospel to people, 
People are treating me like they would treat Christ. I'm in prison. I'm being persecuted. I'm being chased down like Christ would. He says, I'm filling that up in my flesh. So Paul's not saying there that he is trying to complete what Christ has done. He's saying, really, there's still much suffering to be done by the church as we take this gospel message to the world. So that means if you are a minister of Christ, that you will suffer. Oftentimes, people, when they first get into ministry, and they, they are very new, they always they have that look in their eye when they say, you know, Shalom, I don't know if this is worth it. And I usually say, oh, welcome to ministry. Because ministry sometimes feels like being a doormat. People walk on you, wipe the dirt off on you, abandon you, leave you there. Be rough. You read Paul says people abandoned him. Jews were after him. Gentiles were after him. You read all of his sufferings. And the, the truth is that trials and tribulation and suffering comes for all those who want to be in ministry. So it says to you, if you think ministry is just going to be this easy thing, wrong. But did you notice what Paul said about his suffering, which is really strange? He says, I rejoice. With rejoicing, he endures this suffering. Paul's weird. <laughs> because he says, I'm rejoicing in my suffering. I'm getting flogged. Psh, praise God. I'm shipwrecked. There's sharks in here, but praise God for this. Like, how many of us actually praise God for what we're in? For what we're suffering. Now, Paul knew what he's suffering is producing something that is greater than the suffering. Eternal fruit. An actual perseverance. He talks about that. And, and here's, here's what is so amazing to me. And I praise God for, did you know, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, you're a Christian today because somebody suffered. Somebody was burned at the stake so that you can have a translation of God's word. Somebody died so that the gospel would come to you, would come to me. And we are, we are to continue that. We are to go to the world. Whether you're going across the street to your friend's house or you're going across the pond to a jungle where they hate Christ, you must be prepared to endure suffering. Paul is like a bird singing in a darkened cage. And his joy cannot be quieted. People say to me sometimes, I'm losing the joy of ministry. You know why? You know what joy is? Joy is really a deep down confidence that God is in control. And does that ever change? Because that never changes, we should never lose our joy. Because we know God is always in control of our life. And people who say that, really, you're really being prideful because what you're saying is, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to suffer like I deserve better than this. You know what the reality is? You deserve worse. <laughs> and praise God for his grace. Jesus still died for us. So we must endure suffering. Number two, what we must be. What we must be. We must be servants. Look again, verse 25. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Paul was the baddest theologian on the planet. Paul was actually given a tour of heaven. He showed, hey, this is the buffet. This is the gym. That's where we do our swimming classes. This is like, he's like showing them all of heaven. And Paul's like, yes, I know a man who was caught up into the third heaven. He's like, he's talking about himself. Why is he talking to the third person? I know someone. He saw that. Like, we know it was you, Paul. Stop being so humble. <laughs> he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He walks around. He touched people. They're healed. There is... There are very few people on the planet who have ever lived who are greater than Paul. No one in this room is greater than Paul. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm close, but... <laughs> but... No one in this room it can get close. And how does Paul... Why does he describe himself? A servant. The word we use for deacon is the word that... A servant. You guys ever get your car washed at the... I think it's called Rain Tree. 
and you go, you take your car through there, and then when you get out, the workers there, sometimes four or five of them get out, and they just start wiping your car, cleaning your car, vacuuming your car, like a bunch of just, they just converge on your vehicle and just start going crazy. And I sit there sometimes thinking, like, that is such a work of service. And that's a picture of what Paul is doing. He, can you imagine? Paul the apostle gets out. You, you get out of your car, and there's Paul the apostle. He's saying, hey, you want your windows? I can, I can get this thing off right here. That's Paul. See, people, when they want to get into ministry, they want to get into ministry because they want to live like a king or a queen. I want people to, to serve me, and I want to tell people what to do. I want to be on the stage with all the other ministers on the roster. I, I, this, this, is, this is the problem when people don't want to, they, they would rather preach than hand out envelopes. Paul says, I'm, I'm a servant. And if you want to get into ministry because you think this is going to elevate you, you're going to live like a king or a queen, then you, you, you don't, don't do it. Paul says, I'm a servant. I, I'm, a, I'm a deacon. I'm one who, who comes and I, I wash your feet. And that and, and that's not a bad thing. So many people they want to be they want to be you know in charge CEO. But really, what Paul says, what real ministry is about, it's about being a servant. Number three, what we must proclaim, what we must proclaim, we must proclaim the word of God. Look again, verse twenty-five. He says, uh, "I become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you." He says, "The word of God in its fullness." Paul says, I am a minister that is supposed to preach God's word in its fullness, in its completeness. Amen. Now, Paul gets more specific as to what he's meaning when he says the word of God in its fullness. You know, uh, Paul was a man who said, I resolved to preach nothing but Christ and him crucified. That was, that was Paul's whole thing. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Christ, Christ. That's, that's all he wanted to preach. But here he gets specific about a, a special part of his ministry, which is the preaching of a mystery. That's what happened here. Mystery. Ooh, a mystery. Like, you know, was it Agatha Christie novels? and Like, there's a mystery. Don't think of mystery like in that way. A mystery is this truth that lay hidden in the pages of the old testament that would later be uncovered so one example would be remember genesis three fifteen, which uh called the proto evangelium which is the first preaching of the gospel but it's kind of hidden is what it says i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel now if you're reading that you're like okay somebody's gonna step on a snake's head all right. <laughs> but what is that really referring to? That's referring to Christ on the cross, the the serpent biting him on the heel, which is his death on the cross, but his resurrection crushing the head of the serpent. So Christ, even though he died, he would rise again. But death and sin and the devil will never rise again. So this is what Paul says, I'm here to preach. But if you're reading that, you would not like if you were like in you know three days after that, you'd be like, Oh, this is Christ. And the cross, I get it. It's a mystery that lay hidden. But what, what happens? Paul comes along and he begins to show people the whole Old Testament is about Jesus. He goes into the uh, synagogue and he begins to teach the, the other Jews in it and prove to them from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. What scriptures was he using? He was not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he definitely wasn't in Acts because he was in Acts. He was pointing to the Old Testament and using the Old Testament to prove Jesus was the Christ. But his, what is the mystery? He says, the mystery here is Christ in you, the hope of glory, or Christ among you. So here's the mystery, that Gentiles, you Gentiles, you get to be a part of God's family. That's the mystery. And now it goes even further than that, than just saying the mystery that Gentiles are being brought into God's family because that was pretty much known, that the Gentiles will be brought into God's family. If you read the Old Testament, it talks about all the nations. But what, what was sort of hidden and now being uncovered by Paul is that the Gentiles and the Jews would be fellow heirs. See, what Jews thought, yeah, Gentiles, they can be a part of this, but they're going to be like the lower class. 
and we'll be the upper class in heaven. So we'll, you know, we'll be in heaven. They'll, they'll be there, but they'll be the lower class. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Here's the, here's the mystery that God is saving, not just Jews, but he's also saving Gentiles and they are fellow heirs together. So amen, Gentiles, because you all get to be a part of God's family. And this is the mystery that God preached to, I mean, that Paul was preaching to the church there at Ephesus. But did you notice how he said he preached this and how he proclaimed this? Two things, admonishing and with teaching. One being negative, the other being positive. What is admonishing? Admonishing really is just to warn somebody. Sometimes when you're preaching, when you're, te- when you're preaching, proclaiming, you need to warn people. A lot of people don't like to be warned. They don't, they don't like to be told what to do. But what you're doing when you do admonish someone is you're showing them this is not the right way. You need to turn away from that. And we need that, don't we? How many times have you warned somebody about getting into that relationship would be a bad idea? Like, don't, don't, don't go out with him. They say, but I, but I love him. And then they end up marrying them or being with them, and then they're in a situation that they have to be for the rest of their life. Here's the essence of, of admonishing. Admonishing is encouraging people to do what they already know they should do. Amen. See, a lot of people, they don't want you to tell them what to do. They want you to co-sign what they already want to do. So I want to marry this guy. I want to be with this guy. I want to be with this girl. Be like, yeah, but he's not a Christian. I know, but yesterday he said Jesus. <laughs> he said it. I heard him. So God's working in his heart, and I just believe God is, that's what he's doing. That's how people talk. People, be, like, they take the, sm- the smallest thing. Like, he wanted to listen to gospel music on Sunday. Now, I just know the Holy Spirit is working in his life. Like, you're like, no. I've literally talked to people, counseled people, where they say, well, maybe God wants me to, like, witness and to, like, be a light in their life. It's like, no. And I'm looking at them like... Do you hear yourself? And finally, it's like, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I just, because our, we want what we want. We want, we want sin. We want what is forbidden. We don't want something until it's forbidden. You can't have that? I can't? Oh, okay. But what we do when we teach it, we admonish. That's what good teachers, preachers of God's word, they warn you before you get off the cliff. And people don't like that. So Paul says, we, I admonish people, that's negative, but then there's also the positive. He says, we also teach. What is teaching? It is simply communica- communicating Christian truth. It's just explaining things so that people can understand. So these two things, admonishing and teaching, is the way that Paul says he fulfilled this ministry of the word of God. But did you also notice that, that um, with the first suffering, he said, it comes with rejoicing. But here he says, this teaching and admonishing, it comes with wisdom see here's the thing just because you are called to teach or you're supposed to proclaim doesn't mean that there is not wisdom that needs to be used in doing it sometimes when i'm teaching there are things i decide to say and not to say based on what is either going on in the room who i see and i'm not saying i don't say things because somebody's going to be offended but some things are just not the right time to say it you ever heard somebody preach at a funeral versus how they preach at a wedding Versus how they preach on Sunday morning. It's, uh, like, it's confused me when I was younger and watched my dad preach at funerals. I was like, that was so short. <laughs> and like, why is he being so like, he's just, and he's always like the same message, <laughs> the gospel. And he's always like, and I realized it's a wisdom thing. He didn't say, uh, on a funeral, everybody turn to Malachi chapter 3. Yeah. We're talk about tithing. That's, a, that's an okay to, 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 to teach about, but not at a funeral. And not at a wedding. <laughs> Tied to us, yes. <laughs> so there, there's times where you need to know, hey, the occasion, what, is, what, is, what should I do? Same thing is true with warning. Sometimes, listen, some people are like, they just like dogs. Like, uh, we, need to, we need to deal with this. You messed up, I got to deal with this. And say, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. Wait. <laughs> With wisdom. Yes, you can admonish, but with wisdom. It's not time yet. When we were growing up, my siblings, we knew we can ask our parents for almost anything within reason, and they would give it to us. But there were also times where we'd say, Shante, go ask dad if he can take us to Chuck E. Cheese or to Scandia. And she would go, and she would come back. She's like, it's not the right time. (laughs) 
Because you know, they would have a hard day talking to one of y'all, and then we'd come home and we'd just be, you know, you could just tell. He just, you know, he ain't for the business today. Say, hey, father, he what? Oh, nothing. <laughs> So you got. There are times to admonish people, times to wait, times like you know what? I might not be the best person to say this to you. So teaching and admonishing is something that should be done with all wisdom. Now, some of you, I know you're saying, "I'm not a teacher, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a minister." And let me just tell you, God, let me hear what you're thinking so I can rebuke you. That is wrong. And this is why I know this. Colossians chapter three, verse sixteen. Look what he says: "Let the word of Christ." dwelling you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms hymns and spiritual songs so we like that part i like to sing but do you like to teach and admonish yes you might not be doing it on the level of someone who's called to be a teacher or a pastor but you still are called to teach singing these songs with gratitude in your heart to god so all of us are called to preach, to teach, to admonish the word of God like Paul was. And then what we must do, what we must do, we must work hard, work hard. Look at verse 29. Him we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Paul says, ministry is hard work. Somebody told their son he was lazy, and she told him, you know, you should be a pastor because they don't do anything. You should just go go into ministry because all you got to do is go there on Sunday, give a few in inspirational words. It's the perfect job for you. People, people don't recognize the hard work that is ministry. Did you note Paul said, it's to this end I labor. The word he's there for labor means to work so hard that you almost pass out. To work to exhaustion. Then he uses another word, struggling. Both of those words that he used also in chapter 2, verse 1. These are words that you would find in the athletic realm. Imagine someone who runs a mile in under five minutes. And how they feel at the end of that. How many of you guys have ever worked out so hard that you thought your soul was about to leave your body? We worked out with my brother one time and he had us doing this workout. And I literally, I literally saw my body <laughs> from the top. I said, ah, I'm going to glory. I couldn't. I was so tired. Art, <coughs> Art was here. He said he had a heart rate body. He said, ah, my heart rate 200. <laughs> I'm going to die. That's the picture Paul's giving of ministry, that I'm working myself to exhaustion. People think ministry is, ministry is hard. Ministry is difficult. Ministry, when you get home, I am, I, sometimes I'm like, I feel like I have been doing everything under the sun today. Because it's exhausting. And if you want to get into ministry, no, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. That's what Paul says. It's going to be like being an athlete who's been running a mile or a wrestler who's been wrestling for a good two, three minutes. And is, I, I watch people in my school do wrestling. That's a brutal thing. But that's the word. In fact, Paul later on in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 2 says that Epaphras was wrestling in prayer. Same word. Wrestling in prayer for you. Prayer could be hard work if you're doing it right. So what is the nature of ministry? There, there is so much that we're supposed to be. But also notice Paul says he doesn't just work hard. As you notice, he says there, I, I labor struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Here's the key to ministry, to being effective in ministry, is to work in his power. This is the key to successful ministry is that you would work in his power now what happens when you are filled with his power and with his energy you don't start vibrating which would be cool if you're like oh the power of god is on me you start feeling vibrations that'd be that'd be interesting but really what being filled with the power of god's energy is he gives you the energy to do what he what he's calling you to do which is interesting because paul he says i'm working but it's not just me it's god who's working in me and 
Sometimes we get it wrong. We think that it's all us and we just leave God out of it. Or we say, God, it's all you. Sometimes we pray, God, move. And he's like, you move. Lord, save the lost. So you go out there. I'm, I, I don't have a mouth down there. You are my hands. You are my feet. But it must be done in the power of the Spirit. And this is what I love about this for me as I meditated on this this week. Paul was a powerful man. Paul had the energy of God running through him, and yet he still f- faced difficulty He still was abandoned. He still had depression. He still had hardship. And for me, I said, just because I have difficulties in life doesn't mean that God is not still working through us. As a church, sometimes it can feel like, man, what is happening? But the truth is, when we ask God, God, would you work in us and through us? He promises to do that. And we shouldn't care about what the results look like because God is responsible for the results. The presence of difficulty doesn't mean the absence of his presence. And God does not work instead of our working, but through our working. As quickly, let's see what the goal of ministry is. What is Paul's goal for ministry? We've seen the nature of it. What is the goal? And the four things, we'd be encouraged in heart, we'd be united in love, that we would know Christ, and that we would be mature. And we'd be encouraged in heart. Look again at verse 2 of chapter 2. Paul says, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart. What does it mean to encourage somebody? It literally means to call alongside and always has the idea of enabling or aiding a person to meet some difficult situation with confidence. This is, last couple weeks ago I was in court. And I I haven't been in court in a long time. And I was telling somebody, I was so intimidated as I sat. I wasn't even on trial myself. But I remember sitting there and and the judge came in and I just started shaking. So I didn't even do anything. I just felt like I'm gonna do something in this courtroom that's gonna get me thrown into jail. But he had this black robe on and he sat there and I came up to the stand and I sat there and I was just, I could feel my hands shaking. I was just like, what is going on? It's just, and I remember, I started thinking like, man, what, what, what confidence you would have if you were sitting there, you were on trial and there was somebody next to you that said, I got you. I know this judge. I know everything about this case. You will not lose. I'm here with you. You can face this trial with confidence, complete confidence. That's what an encourager does. They come along somebody who is fearful, someone who is scared, someone who's facing a situation, and they come alongside them, and they help them to face that situation with confidence. That's Paul's goal of ministry, is that the body of Christ would be united, that they would be encouraged in heart. When we think about coming to church, we often think about coming to church as a way for us to just check that off of our list. I went to church. And we often, like, like, almost like it's an attendance thing. I was there three weeks out of four. But you know, church is not so much about just being in the building. This is, this is we know this well, but Hebrews 10, 24 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And then he says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, the reason you come to church, if, you, if somebody is skipping church, if somebody's skipping church, it means that they don't understand the purpose of it or they don't need encouraging. Can I tell you, I need encouraging every single week. I need, I need people to come alongside me and to help me. And Paul says, this is not an attendance thing. He says, so that we can encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. We need to be in each other's faces encouraging one another as people are facing difficulty. We're in Sunday school talking about mental illness. This is exactly why this passage is there. As we are with each other, we see, I can see that they're struggling. How can I encourage them? Can I encourage you to do something? Um, what would happen if on Saturday nights 
we would spend time asking God, God, would you give me a person? Bring somebody's face to my mind that I can encourage. Someone I can pray for. We're a church. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Someone that I can give a word of prophecy to. Someone that I can share, pray with them. And you, they, God would give you that person, and we come to church ready to encourage people. Because sometimes we come to church, I'm ready to get my blessing. I'm ready to get my word. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're needy people. But what if we came to church that 30 minutes between church, I mean, between Sunday school and church, we're looking to see how, who can I encourage? Who did God put on my heart to talk to? Just see how their week was going. Something I began doing with my wife and kids, asking what are your highs and what are your lows? What are your highs this week? Oh, it was great. Work was great. What are some of your lows? Oh, man, I'm getting persecuted a little bit because of my stance on homosexuality. You can pray with them. You can encourage them. You can give them scripture. That's what we need. People often talk about coming to church and feeling like they're empty, and then when they leave, feeling filled up. That's how it should happen. Encouraged in heart, ready to face whatever we need to face with difficulty. Would you do that? Would you ask God Saturday night, Sunday morning, God, who can I encourage? Bring somebody to my heart, to my mind, that I can help them keep walking this Christian life. Because many of us, we are hanging on by a thread. Yes. Secondly, that we would be united in love. That we would be knit together in love, literally. Not in knowledge, but in love. Can I ask you a question? Do you love the church? Amen. Do you love this church, your church? Can I say, um, there are some moments in my life where I just say, I love my church. Last week was one of them as you guys just poured out love upon the kids and you guys gave them money so they can have a weekend of fun. I just said, I love, I even said to the parents, I love our church, I love our pastor that would give of their, their last and say, hey, here, here's some fun. And the kids, they had an amazing time. They ate a lot. <laughs> <laughs> had fun, got an amazing, and, and I can tell you, God did something in their lives. We tried... I, I'm not going to say that because I don't want to get in trouble. But I, I might say it. No, I'm not going to say it. Um, but they had they had so much fun, and and I said as we were as we were there, I, said, I, mean, I love that our church does things like that, and that's what God wants. He wants us to be united in love. But the thing that was um, about to cause division in the church was division because of error. This error that came in and said, you don't, it's Jesus plus equals, you know, whatever you need. And, and Paul's going to come along and says, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. But the error is what was dividing them. The error is what was causing them to not really see each other as they're supposed to see each other. We are supposed to be united in love. That's one of the goals of ministry, that we would not be divided, that we'd be loving each other. It doesn't mean we don't have issues, doesn't mean we don't admonish, but it does mean that we do try to keep the church knit together in love. The devil is like a cat that just always wants to rip stuff apart. That's why I don't like cats. <laughs> Some of y'all got cats, and they just be always around, just touching you, and just, they look evil. I'm like, man, get off me. <laughs> they were just like, yeah, yeah. What do you, no. And that's the devil. He comes to the churches like, let me, let me, let me just cause a little division right here because of error, because of issues. And what does Paul say? Ministry is like the, the, the ministry of knitting those things back together. Any knitters in the house? Any tapers in the house? We just tape things back up, knit things back together. That's, that's the picture of love. Then, then third, that we would know Christ. That we would know Christ. One of the greatest books, classic books, is a book called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. And uh, if you look on any list of classic books, if you haven't read that book, read it. Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Packer. My dad had him in a class, and I think I have the book. I think it's signed by him. Yeah, I was looking at it the other day. Um, and this book is is a book about knowing God, but it's full of theology. How do you know God? Knowing God is about looking at what God has revealed in His Word about Himself. And in the book, here's how 
Dr. Packer says, he says, the, the conviction behind the book is that ignorance of God, ignorance both of his ways and the practice of communion with him lies at the root of much of the church's weakness today. Disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfolded, as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. This way you can waste your life and lose your soul. Paul says that he wants them to have a certainty about what has been given to them, namely Christ. Let me read this to you in the New Living Translation, chapter 2, verse 2. It says, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. This is what Paul says. I want you to have confidence that the, that the Christian faith is true and that you as a Gentile, you are a fellow heir with Christ. And the way you get there is by knowing Christ because in Christ, all of the treasures of knowledge and wisdom are hidden. So if you get Jesus, you get all those things as well. So the, the point Paul is saying, I want you to know Christ so that you can have confidence. Then lastly, he says that we would be mature look at verse where is this verse 28 we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in christ don't get thrown off by the word perfect it just means complete or mature i think my favorite one of my favorite processes was the process of having kids i love being in the bed that morning and then the wife tapping me and saying i think the baby's coming we get out of bed and she puts on her stuff we have the bag packed we go we call, start calling people we get to the hospital it's early in the morning and we get into the room and they put the gown on her start to put the stuff on her then the doctor comes in and we get our rooms a big big room and they start to bring us I go to get her some food and we sit there we just wait and and then the baby starts to come and it's this moment of joy for me pain for her <laughs> but it's still this wonderful experience and 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 then the baby comes and you hold your child and you, you, they take him, they clean him off and, or her off and they make sure everything's working right. Then they give him back to you. You put skin in the skin, you hold him. And then you say, oh my gosh, you say their name. You, you look in their eyes and then you, you take them back to your room and, and you just keep looking at them, keep looking at him. And then something weird happens. They tell you, you need to take it with you. I'm like, what? I like, I like the process of just having them. They're like, no, 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 you have to take it, and you have to raise it. See, as much as I love the process and the experience of, you know, having a baby, that's just the beginning. I have to take that baby to maturity. And this is what Paul's saying. He's saying, we're not just looking to make babies. We want people to be born, but then we also want to bring them to spiritual maturity, from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. And so this is in our mission statement. Uh, we exist to win people to Christ, birth, new birth, and what? Develop them into active disciples, maturity. So the way it is, we want to make adult Christians. We don't want just babies. So as a church, we're not just, we just need new birth. We just want conversions. That's awesome. Praise God. You need to start there. But we also believe there needs to be maturing. And what do I have to do to my kids? I have to warn them. Don't eat that. Don't put the fork into the socket. Don't stab your sister. Don't, <laughs> don't jump off the top of the stairs to the bottom. Your legs aren't strong enough. There's so many things in this world that are dangerous that I didn't realize were dangerous until I had kids. How many times? I didn't even know the number for poison control. We're like, hello, uh, he ate a lot of toothpaste. <laughs> like they're, they're like, oh, it's, it's, it's normal. People do that all the time. Like they, they do. And she, it, but it's this warning. And then there's teaching. And the goal is at one at one point I'm gonna I'm gonna hand them over 
to someone. <laughs> no, who? And say, I did what I could. <laughs> they gonna be what they gonna be. <laughs> And I think all of us, you, your hope is that when you do release your child, you release somebody into society <laughs> who, would, <laughs> who will destroy it, who will be helpful to it. And this is Paul's, Paul saying, at the end, I want to present the church. Could you imagine him saying, this is the church of Colossae and the maturing Christ. And this is what we, we want for you. As your leaders to say, as one day we stand before God, so here's the, the church, Village Baptist Church of Petaluma. And that's a heavy, heavy load. But it's one that we, we love. You stand with me.